countries ever done for us. <laughs> That's also a way of putting today's theme of the session. It's also a very relevant question, only slightly Python-esque, for which I can come up with a lot of different answers, but for time's sake, I only selected three. First of all, we are very good at making beer. Since last year, Belgian beer culture is even considered UNESCO World Heritage. And second, in several decades from now, when climate change really starts to hit us with one flood after the other, we Dutchmen are happy to help you out with building our dikes. But let us now return to the matter at hand. Because third, we have a lot of late Bronze Age and early Iron Age air fields. Uh, so far, I counted about 850 sites for the Netherlands and North Belgium alone, and we try to make sense of them. This abundance of urban data for the Low Countries has resulted in a long list of regional inventories, but also different studies about how these cemeteries uh, should be perceived from a theoretical point of view. Combined, these scholars have come up with some very interesting perspectives on how urban fields once emerged in the Low Countries and which social, cosmological, but also political values they might have represented. Since my own PhD research is also about Ernfield's graves, I, also, I hope that one day my research will also be in this list, but I have a very long way to go, of course. Up to this point, I've mostly presented at conferences about what I was planning to do with all the Ernfield's data from the Low Countries, but today will actually be the first time that I will show you some of my own results and ideas, so please don't shoot me at the spot. Before I come to the point of sharing these thoughts, uh, I will briefly say something about the relevance of a European perspective on urnfields and give a short summary of the aim and methods of my PhD research. In the end, I will present three observations in my data that have struck me so far and what I think are food for thought and discussion. Well, this is the little corner of Europe that we are discussing today. In the literature dealing with urnfields from the Low Countries, this area is mostly referred to as the Northwest European Plain. As the name already suggests, uh, the landscape is characterized by only very slight differences in relief. And as you probably already saw on the distribution map I showed you se several slides ago, most of the urnfields are confined to the higher parts of the landscape in the south and the east. When you would ask an archaeologist from the Low Countries, to describe what an urnfield looks like, he, she or he will probably picture an urnfield as depicted on this slide. A vast cemetery consisting of numerous circular or quadrangular uh, ditches. Um, the cremated remains were deposited in urns or wrappings of organic container. A picture very familiar to me as well. But I can imagine that when you reside somewhere else in Europe, uh, the picture in your mind looks completely different. I gather that at least the circular and quadrangular ditches are absent in your mind's picture. It is true that a lot of regional variation exists in the appearance of urnfields across Europe. This regional variation combined with a rapidly growing amount of data has pushed the urnfield research into a more comprehensible regional perspective since the Second World War. Which in my opinion is also a very sensible development. However, I think it cannot be denied that there are also some larger mechanisms that fuel the emergence of urnfields across many regions in present-day Europe and clearly extended the boundaries that we so much like to define as archaeologists. The most apparent one clearly is the shift from inhumation to cremation that took place in many parts of Europe during the second millennium BC. Naturally, this shift did not happen overnight, but the fact is that towards the capstone of the, Europe, of the, the Bronze Age, many people in Europe were only burying their beloved ones only after they first had been committed to the consuming qualities of fire. Since the scale on which the shift in burial practices took place is that large, it is sometimes being referred to as a spiritual revolution. I think it would be safe to assume that this other idea of dealing with a dead body could easily have traveled along the same extensive trading networks that already existed in Bronze Age Europe. Personally, I am picturing campfire discussions between travelers and traders along the road or at sea during the dark and long hours of the night. Whatever might be the case, when studying urnfields in just a small corner of Europe, I think one must be aware that certain elements we encounter in urnfield graves can have their roots way back in both time and space. Regaining European perspective from time to time is therefore essential. But in order to trace these elements, one must still study urnfields uh, 
on the, the level of the grave uh, itself. And that is what I do for my PhD research. In short, I'm looking into the composition of some 3,000 urnfield graves from the Northwest European plain. Even though these graves may look simple and poor when their appearance and grave cliffs are concerned, mostly just a small hole in the ground with an ugly urn and a few pieces of broken metal, um, The axes and choices reflected in the urnfield graves, they hint at a very richness, actually, in the funerary practices involved. Axes and choices, they were motivated by religious beliefs, uh, practical constraints, but also personal preferences. But all meaningful in their own way. An urnfield grave may therefore be regarded as the residue of the long chain operatoire we call funeral. Or in other words, urnfield graves are meaningful composite artifacts. I am testing this hypothesis by looking into four main aspects of urnfield graves. How were bones treated prior to burial? Which objects were selected for burial? How were bones of how were objects treated prior to burial? And how were these bones and objects finally put together in a grave? I am sure you are convinced by now that a lot of decision making is uh, involved in assembling an urnfield grave. I try to incorporate every possible decision into my database and that has resulted so far in some 45 variables per grave. When you come to think of the simple fact that every single action and decision was done with a reason, infant graves must be, be, must be particularly meaningful. Since I am only halfway in my research, I'm still puzzling what those meanings are. So far I've entered almost 1000 graves in my database and I'm planning for another 2000. Until now, I've mostly been working with urnfields from the southern Netherlands, um, and most of them excavated in the 1990s and 2000s. When combined, these urnfields represent more than 1,800 graves in total, but only 939 graves have been published. For 832 of the 939 graves, there are also um, data available for osteological analysis. And so far, I recorded 211 objects, and 262 of the burials I entered uh, are accompanied with a, some sort of a monument. Even though I'm not even halfway my analysis, I can already see a lot of interesting returning traits among these graves. And as mentioned, I only selected three for today's paper that I translated into themes. And please feel free to comment on these themes after my presentation. The first theme I would like to address is feasting. It is most certainly not a new idea that consumption of food and drink plays some role in the funerary practices of the Urnfield period. But I would argue that on the basis of my observations so far, I would like to suggest that feasting played in fact a major part in the funerary practices of the Urnfield period. This idea is mainly based on the fact that the majority of the grave gifts bear some reference to the consumption of food or drink. Of the 211 objects I recorded, recorded so far, 95 concern pieces of accessory pottery, small drinking cups, bowls and dishes. Also, the presence of animal bones suggests that chunks of meat were accompanying the dead on the pyre, burned animal bones I'm talking about. And even in an unburned state, as was the case in this uh, grave uh, in, uh, in Germany. The exceptional late Bronze Age cemetery in the dunes of The Hague even produced seeds of fruit. Next to the graves themselves, quite regularly, typical tableware and burnt animal bones are found in the ditches surrounding the burials. As you may have noted, the finds I just mentioned already represent three different stages in the entire process of a funeral. First, we have the burnt accessory pottery, fruit seeds and animal bones that suggest that food and drink were already accompanying the dead person on the pyre or were thrown into the fire by the bystanders. Unburned drinking cups, sometimes still standing upright in the, in the grave, and unburned animal bon bones suggest that food and drink were also placed inside the grave after the cremated remains had been interred. And third, typical tableware and animal bones um, from the ditches encircling the burial um, um, monuments suggest that also after the funeral, a grave was revisited and food and drink were consumed. To my mind, the consumption and probably the sharing of food and drink at a funeral underpins a certain sense of community between the bystanders, the mourners and the dead person. I cannot help thinking of the last funeral I went to where we also raised the glass on our dear friend. 
The bronze cauldrons from contemporary chieftain's graves that are interpreted as representing a drinking bout in this life or the next can also be seen in this light. One might even see a symbolic meaning of the chieftain sharing his drink while the more common earth graves take part in the sharing. The second theme I would like to discuss is what I called relational identities. Cremating a dead body opens up a broad spectrum of ways of dealing with a dead body. Not only becomes a dead person tangible, um, since the cremated remains will probably not weigh more than two and a half or three kilograms at the most, but it makes a person, the dead person, also durable, since he or she can in fact be stored almost everywhere for an unlimited period of time. We often assume that the cremated remains were interred almost immediately after the event of the cremation itself, but that of course does not necessarily have to be the case. A final remark regarding the cremation rite is that it makes the body easily dividable. The one to three kilograms of cremated rem uh, remains that usually uh, remain after a cremation uh, can be divided up into as many new entities as one would like. And this last point brings me to the debate of pars pro toto deposition of cremated remains. Especially the on average low weights of cremated remains are usually that are usually encountered in urn food graves has led to the belief that parts of the cremated remains were left out of the grave on purpose. An interesting thought for which there are in fact a few very clear examples. In an urn food telgte, here on the left, only parts of the skull were deposited in the grave. And at the site of Olsevenbergen, only one piece of burnt bone was retrieved from underneath a well-preserved monumental early Iron Age burial mound. It is difficult to state whether pars pro toto deposition was something that counted for the majority of graves, since not many graves have been preserved completely, so that's difficult to test. I more and more start to think that the examples I just mentioned were exceptions, but the rite did clearly occur. Pars pro toto deposition in Erfurt graves is also something that can be seen with the objects. Again, they concern exceptions, but the, as this saw-like bronze object on the picture over here, found in an Urnfield grave at Apeldoorn shows, uh, obviously a large part of this object is missing from the grave, while the grave was still intact when we found it. But what does this all mean? The Urnfields are especially known for their inclusive character. Every member of society is represented in the Urnfields. I think the Urnfields emanate a certain sense of belonging. These people belong together. Dividing up a dead person and the objects that accompanied him or her in the grave also allowed the mourners to extend, to extend this sense of belonging outside the grave to the arena of the living or maybe even to another Urnfield. I would like to conclude this theme with an exceptional case from the Urnfield of Beegde in the southern Netherlands. The early Iron Age Urnfield of Beegde is one of the unique examples of a completely excavated Urnfield. Different monuments were laid bare, among which this long barrow uh, over here. This one. At first sight, the graves 9 and 22 that are located underneath this monument look like ordinary Urnfield graves. However, these two graves together contain body parts of at least 11 individuals. Men, women and children are all represented in these urns. It is unlikely that these 11 people all died at once and clearly not all cremated remains uh, of these 11 individuals were interred underneath this long barrow. There must be parts missing, judging from the total weight of the cremated remains. As long barrows are often considered to represent the founding phase of a new cemetery, could it be that we are dealing here with a relational identity being created between people inside the urn between people in the cemetery, and maybe even uh, with the cemetery where, uh, yeah, maybe even uh, the cemetery where the founders of this grave came from. An interesting thought that I would like to investigate more. I, round up, I will round up with the last theme. What makes an urnfield an urnfield? I've now entered 19 urnfields in my database, and they seem all different to me. Some cemeteries consist predominantly of burial monuments while others did not produce any monuments at all. Some urnfood contain many graves with grave gifts, while other urnfoods did not produce a single grave gift. And in some urnfoods, about 90% of the population was buried in an urn, while there are also urnfoods that do not have any urn at all. 
True enough, the Earth period has a long time span and variation can develop over time and is probably confined to certain regions. But can we still speak of Earthviews when no one was buried in an urn? So far, I only encountered two common features that seem to bind all the cemeteries I've studied so far. They all concern cremation grave cemeteries that were open to all members of society. But doesn't this observation mean that also cremation grave cemeteries, outside what is usually seen as the distribution area of the urnfields across Europe, should be included? I know that I may be out of my league here, but I'm curious about your thoughts about the matter. At least I hope to have shown you that still a lot of potential rests with the thousands of urnfield graves on shelves in museums and depositories, and that this potential also extends beyond lowlands. Thank you for your attention.